Yeah, so I was originally going to speak about uh, the hidden symmetry of twisted bilayer graphene. Um, I decided to switch topics to make it fit a little bit more with the section. Let me try and give the, the one sentence summary of what the previous talk would have been. Um, so in the twisted bilayer graphene, we know there's symmetry coming from spin degeneracy and valley degeneracy. Uh, but interesting in, in these uh, magic angle flat bands, there's not just four bands coming from spin and valley, there's actually eight. Um, and what we show is that there's actually an approximate symmetry uh, which leads to this additional twofold degeneracy. So you get two times two times eight. Um, and a result of that, you can think of the different Mott insulators in twisted bilayer graphene um, as a sort of polarization uh, in this eight dimensional space. Uh, and because of this approximate symmetry, we point out there's very low energy fluctuations in this order parameter, which is probably related to what Alan told us about yesterday with these low energy collective modes he was seeing. So presumably this um, has important implications for superconductivity. Um, and it's also an interesting question in general what the relationship is between the insulators seen in twisted bilayer graphene and the Hubbard model we're used to, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Okay, so to move to this talk, um, this is a, a work that we actually put up about a year ago. It's predominantly done by Aaron Sotts, who was then a grad student at Berkeley, who's now moved on to Canada. Um, he was a Joe Moore student. Um, and I'm going to be telling you about an infinite density matrix normalization group study of a model which needs very little introduction. It's just going to be the half build triangular lattice Hubbard model. Um, so we're going to consider um, uh, the isotropic triangular lattice, the top AP, and um, a Hubbard interaction U. And of course, we're half filling. So if you're large enough, the system uh, largely has magnetic fluctuations, you have charge fluctuations. And you choose triangles because triangles lead to frustration. Um, and it goes back, going back to the 70s, that the triangular lattice would be frustrated enough um, that rather than ordering like a square lattice, uh, you'd actually get frustrations down to zero temperature via mechanisms like a new valence bonds leading to phases like spin liquids. Um, but beyond theory, there's of course good experimental motivation for it. We heard about some of those earlier. Um, in the early 2000s, some of the first examples of spin liquids uh, were exactly in these organic triangular compounds. Um, so there's two families I'm going to be mentioning. One is, I don't even know how to say the beginning of it, but the DMIP, uh, and the other is the DMIP. Um, both are described by approximate output models. There's actually a slight manner to probably the group on the outcome of the DMIP, about 10% or so. Um, and the system is fairly well two dimensional, so a good starting point when we discuss. As just the isotropic Hubbard model. Okay, so we know that the key parameter because we're working at half filling is u over t, uh, the of the Hubbard interaction. If you're working at very large u, where the charge fluctuation screws out, and you're left with a spin model. Um, so we'd be looking at the Heisenberg model on the triangular lattice. Um, but in these materials, u over t is about eight, uh, which actually isn't that large. Um, and in fact, if you change the pressure of the system just by you know, over the range of about one picture Pascal, uh, the BDT compound undergoes a metal insulator transition from a Mott insulator at a uh, low pressure to a superconductor and then to a metal. That tell us, tells us we're not actually in a super large U over T, U over T to this. So we should think if we want to map the system back to um, uh, the spin degrees of freedom. In addition to the first order in theory term, which is the conventional Heisenberg exchange, uh, the higher order of fluctuation points in T over U would lead to more complicated magnetic interactions. The first one, for instance, is this ring exchange, which takes four spins uh, and exchanges them. But then there'd be more and more terms at higher order in T over U. Um, and presumably these are actually playing a quite important role in the magnetic physics of the system. So what's seen in experiment? Um, I'll mention the BDT first. Uh, so at the lowest temperatures, they can look at the magnetic susceptibility and they can compare uh, two different versions of this compound. Uh, one of them is a different more organic, it shows a big peak in susceptibility, indicating that it's an antiferromagnet. But in the BDT compound, uh, there's no feature seen in susceptibility down to the lowest temperatures, which is the evidence for any lack of magnetic order. And I think um, this is pretty incontrovertible. Um, once we know it doesn't seem to order, there's an interesting question of whether it's gap or gapless. When I say gap or gapless, I mean like a spin fluctuation is gap or gapless. So there's two types of probes you can do to look at this. One is a thermodynamic probe measuring the heat capacity. Um, and it's actually seen that 
in the compound, which are similar to the low temperature, is a linear T heat capacity, uh, whereas in the sample of quarter, uh, there's no linear heat capacity. So this seems to be strong evidence for it being, uh, there being gapless excitations. Um, but you might worry that these gapless excitations are actually coming from defects. Uh, the reason they cut off the gap is Um, so, <clears throat> if we want to look at whether there's gapless excitations and try and disentangle that uh, from the defects, it's useful to do thermal transport. Um, so, the data on the right is showing the thermal conductivity. And if you look at the thermal conductivity, at least in the DDT compound, uh, it goes to zero at low temperature um, and it looks actually like a passive. Um, so, that would actually be an indication for uh, intrinsically there being a spin gap. Uh, the, the DMIT compounds a little bit differently. Uh, different. Um, in the early, well, early meaning in the, the first experiments on the thermal conductivity um, by the group at Kyoto, they actually saw linear T thermal conductivity. Uh, this was extremely exciting because it would seem to indicate that there's a Fermi surface work of uh, spin excitations in the system, uh, which would correspond to the famous uh, spin on um, Fermi surface possibility. Um, more recently, actually, just this year, there's been uh, experiments at Sherbrooke and Pudon, which we investigated this material. And they actually found that the, um, the thermal conductance did not have a linear T part at lowest temperatures. Uh, if you, so here is the old data from Kyoto, which is actually quite a T, they don't actually see activated behavior, they see um, some higher power ball. Um, so it's a little bit unclear actually in the system what's uh, been the difference between these two. Um, but at the moment, it seems like there's not actually such solid evidence for the linear T heat test or linear T thermal conductance. Okay, so from a theoretical perspective, uh, what would we expect about the nature um, of the potential spin liquid? Uh, well, we have a phase diagram with just one parameter, u over t. Of course, for small u, we start out in the metal. For very large u, um, the magnetic interactions are going to be dominated by the Heisenberg term. Um, and it's actually known now that if you just take the Heisenberg model on the triangle lattice, it's not quite frustrated enough, and you get a 120 degree A order. So it works. But as you go to this intermediate u over t regime, uh, these ring exchange terms and others become important. Um, that can lead to additional quantum fluctuations uh, and many different numerical um, experiments going back to the 90s uh, find that indeed that destroys the nail order and you get some sort of non-magnetic insulator. In the um, so that agrees at least um, with what the experiments see which also sees no magnetic. Order. Okay but when we say something is a spin liquid there's of course many different types of spin liquids. Uh, you could have uh, the famous spin on Fermi surface, gap Z spin liquid, you could have nodal gapless states, chiral spin liquids, et cetera. And I'll review some of those important ones uh, over the next couple of slides. Um, some studies have already looked at, into this with DMRG. Uh, one of them just did a circumference two cylinder, uh, and they found that it was consistent with a nodal spin liquid, a gapless spin liquid. Um, and finite DMRG, meaning it was finite circumference and finite length. Um, they couldn't tell what type of spin liquid it was, but it seems uh, those systems to actually be a gap spin liquid. So what was this spin on Fermi surface? Uh, well, the idea is pretty easy to describe if you think of it in terms of good school projection. You just start with a Fermi surface for the triangular lattice and you project that double occupancy. Um, and that leaves behind actually the gapless spin fluctuation. If you want to think about this in a part common language, you fractionalize the electron into a bosonic charge on and a fermionic spin on. Uh, the charge ons we put into the modern slater and then spinning on stay in the Fermi surface. Um, so the famous work of Lezik Mochenik argued that this would be the heat capacity coming from the initial spin ons of two to three thirds. Now experiment seems a little bit higher than that. And then you'd also get uh, thermal transport from the spin ons as well. So the other competing class are gap spin liquids. Uh, there's many types here. Um, one potential is a uh, ZP spin liquid, which preserves time reversal. Um, but the one I'm going to be discussing is the chiral spin liquid, which spontaneously breaks time reversal. This was first proposed by Paul Meyer and Laughlin, um, where they argued that you could understand the sort of spin liquid as the analog of the fraction of quantum. Um, and I'm going to go into that in a bit more detail later. <clears throat> 
So what's the calculation method we're going to attack this problem with? Uh, we're going to be doing infinite density matrix normalization group. So that just means it's DMRG where you take the limit, the dynamic limit of your one-dimensional chain so that you don't have any edge effects. Um, DMRG is an unbiased method for solving 1D problems, uh, but of course we want to solve the 2D Hubbard model. Um, so how do we do this? Uh, it's the standard snake trick where you take your 2D lattice, you put the finite circumference, and then you wrap the lattice onto the cylinder of some circumference L. So we're going to be looking at circumferences of L from between uh, 2 and 6 in the study. Now, one effect that we're going to come back to is if you thought about the original Fermi surface, you go from having a Fourier zone, which is a 2D continuum, um, you know, what you get by putting it on a cylinder is you actually quantize the allowed momenta in the y direction. But I can think of the Fourier zone as being sliced into a set of discrete wires. And that's going to be important for interpreting the physics. <clears throat> so the snake DMRG is uh, well known, but we actually do it a little bit differently in this study. So usually what you do is each of your orbitals in your one dimensional chain would correspond to the X and Y position. So this would be X, this would be Y, and you just choose a 1D ordinary and where you slide around um, this, that's why it's called the snake. But what we actually do um, is we do a Fourier transform in Y. So the basis we're using is X and momentum in the Y direction. Um, so the reason we do this uh, because that allows us to exploit the rotational symmetry um, because you know, the rotation of the cylinder has a good action in its basis. And then we can, in the DMRD simulation, actually uh, exactly preserve the momentum. Um, the momentum uh, and that leads to much more efficient matrix computations, lower memory, um, and allows us to go to larger systems. Um, so that's one of the basic technical tricks that we used in this work. Um, and that's why, you know, the previous DMRG was able to do circumference two, here we're doing circumference four and six. Uh, so what's the summary of what we find? Uh, well, what we find is in this intermediate spin liquid, uh, here's the gap, it spontaneously breaks time reversal. And um, we can find evidence that the topology of this spin liquid is exactly that of the kolmeyer locking state of the chiral spin liquid. Um, so for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit more intuition about what this phase is and what our evidence is. Okay, so why do we call it the chiral spin liquid? Um, well, the time reversal symmetry breaking can actually be detected by a local order parameter, which is just the spin chirality. So you look at the, the triple product of the spin along a plaquette. This is really odd under both time reversal and a mirror symmetry, uh, but it preserves uh, the combination of the two, so that's why it's a chiral order. Um, so how do I understand what this chiral spin liquid is? It's not just that it's, you know, time reverse to symmetry breaking. It's also a topological order which has fractionalized spin excitation. Um, so the easy way to understand this, with uh, Bob Loft and Chris outline, is to think of your spin as actually a hard core boson. We're up and down, uh, mapped to empty and filled. And then because we're at an unmagnetized system, that means your spin system is at half filling. And the idea is that the bosons then enter into the new equals one half bosonic fractional quantum Hall state, which is the Lofton state. So that's why the chiral spin liquid is just a Lofton state of spins. So we can then read off quite a bit of the phenomenology from this mapping. The fact that the fractional quantum Hall effect is charging compressible, maps on to having a spin gap in the spin liquid. And the fact that quantum Hall states have gapless chiral edge states uh, would mean that if you take an edge of one of these spin systems, there'd be a uh, Gap with spin currents at the edge. Uh, and likewise, also in principle, there'd be a thermal Hall effect, so the compact line uh, that we heard about yesterday. <clears throat> now, unlike in the quantum Hall effect, where the time reversal symmetry breaking comes from the magnetic field, here we're claiming it actually happens um, spontaneously. So, in whatever numerics we do, we should actually find two degenerate copies of the ground state, one in which you can think of. Spin ons are spontaneously rotating clockwise, and the other is counterclockwise related by either T or P. Um, this would actually have important implications at finite temperature. Since this is a discrete symmetry, um, the fact that you've broken time reversal is like breaking an Ising symmetry. But if you go to a higher temperature above the Ising transition, the system would actually break up into samples of the two different chiralities. Uh, but unlike the usual Ising model, we know that if you look at a boundary between the chiral spin liquid and its time reversal partner, will actually be one of these chiral edge states. Um, so what that would mean is that coming from each of these chiral edge states, um, it means if you look at a temperature, um, which is 
uh, low enough compared to the size of the edge states uh, that they contribute a linear t specific heat capacity. So, I mean, it's tempting to then relate this to the heat capacity which is seen in the experiment. Okay, so what is the evidence? Um, I'm going to walk you through uh, both the topological part of it uh, and the part of it just showing the absence of symmetry breaking. Okay, so first I'll show you the data from the L equals four cylinder. Um, and I want to argue that there's two transitions, one at about U over T 10.6, uh, where the 120 degree nail order sets in, uh, and the other at 8.3, which is the metal insulator transition. So let's look at the, uh, the nail state first. So the first thing I'm just going to measure is the correlation length of the system along the length of the cylinder. Uh, and there's a slight technical complication here, because in DMRG, uh, it's a variational method. Um, where the accuracy only increases in proportion to the size of the variation of the uh, So it's not like doing exact diagonalization when you just get back to the right answer. Um, so the way people quantify the size of the variation of space is the so-called bond dimension of the DMRD. That's the standard pi here. And all we really need to know is that as pi increases, the calculations are harder, the results are more accurate, and it's uh, sort of proven that if you take pi to infinity, in that limit, you will get um, so what that means is when we look at these plots, implicitly we need to be extrapolating the heat net bond dimension of the reactive behavior. Um, the basic physics you can see is that at low U in the metal, the correlation line keeps diverging with the frequency accuracy of the simulations. Uh, and the heat of the gap region here, if you were to extrapolate it, you find it extrapolate to something finite. And then the correlation length again spikes to infinity uh, at, a, at a phase transition uh, between the non magnetic insulator. So we can then, in the nail order, just measure what the spin structure factor is, the spin spin uh, response, and then Fourier transform it. So this is showing S of Q, and as I mentioned, because it's on a, uh, a cylinder, our momentum gets sliced into discrete rings. And you can see that if you look below U, S of Q is relatively featureless, whereas if you look at U of T12, which is in the 120 degree state, uh, the S of Q peaks at the K and K prime points, which are exactly the wave vectors of the 120 degree order. Uh, if you want to look at it quantitatively, um, you measure the, the, the peak in S of Q, uh, and it actually jumps um, so not analytically as you go to quantitative groups. Now, some of you might wonder why it doesn't actually go to infinity. Uh, that's a 1D effect. Because this is a model with spin SO3 symmetry, um, technically, there's no way that the SO3 can spontaneously break in 1D um, if you have an even circumference cylinder. This is just the existence of the whole band gap. So we don't actually expect an infinite um, heat and S of Q on the cylinder. Okay, so how do we detect the metal insulator transition? Uh, one way to, quanti um, to, um, uh, to quantify this uh, is to measure the central charge of the system. So recall that in 1D, the central charge measures the number of gapless modes. Um, if you took a metal and then wrap it onto a cylinder, you get one gapless mode for every allowed momentum that cuts through the Fermi surface. So for instance, on the circumference four cylinder, to just work out the shape of the Fermi surface, you'd have three modes that leads to, um, uh, and then and spin, so that would lead to a central charge of six. The spin on Fermi surface would actually have six minus one is five, uh, whereas the various gap phases would have central charge of zero. Um, I won't go into the technical details, but the way we can measure the central charge being using DMRG numerics is to actually measure the amount of entanglement between the right and left half of the cylinder, uh, and then look at how it scales with the accuracy of the DMRG numerics. Um, and it's known that there's actually a scaling theory um, where the power law dependence between the entanglement uh, and the accuracy of the DMRG, that power law actually tells you uh, what the central charge is. So using that um, uh, scaling analysis, we're, we're able to estimate the central charge as a function of U over T, um, we start out in the metal with a result purely for the six, about uh, 10 or so. And you go across to the metal insulator transition that dives down, um, and then consistent largely over T, um, you know, if you know, you extrapolate in terms of accuracy, the central charge is zero. Um, now, one of the important things here is that if there had been a spin on Fermi surface, we would have expected that there'd be a plateau in the central charge where it would go from six to five. And then from five to zero. Um, so this seems to be evidence um, that in fact um, central charge 
Um, there's some technical details here, but let me mention there's two different ways of measuring the sensor charge. Um, and so I'm just using air space for two different um, steering approaches. You might worry in here, but it doesn't look like the sensor charge ever goes to zero, even though I'm using the gap for signature. But really, what you need to be doing is looking at how this data happens to the gap at the same time. Um, and uh, if you the extrapolation is slightly different than here. You can clearly see that there's some range of zero that's seen, but we can definitely tell if the sensor charge is zero. And then it's just really hard to tell uh, in this region because the um, correlation length is extremely large. Even if, in principle, it might be finite. Okay, to look at a more uh, perhaps familiar uh, measure to diagnose the metal insulator transition, you can just look at the density density structure factor, uh, Fourier transformed along the cylinder. Um, and what you would expect in the metal is you've got a linear tooth and it's got power law um, correlations and the density. Whereas with the insulator, of course, you get something analytic in particular to like T squared. An example of that on the right. Uh, so what you've done to quantify this is you just look at the inverse curvature of M at K equals zero. And then we extrapolate that in terms of the actual surface of margin to get the plot curves here. You can see pretty clearly it goes to it's kind of fun to also look then, you know, if you have this metal insulator transition, how does the Fermi surface get destroyed? Uh, so one way to look at this is just to look at the electron occupation uh, in K. So of course, at U0, we just have the metal and you have a perfect jump of NK by one at the Fermi surface. Uh, and then as soon as you turn on uh, the, the, the U, and the K spreads out. Um, so, if you just look at it by I, there's not really anything obviously different between, say, U equals 6 and U equals 9. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, that's actually a consequence of being on the cylinder. So, since we do an infinite cylinder, formally, at the you know, largest distances, this flows to a one-dimensional system rather than a two-dimensional system. And you know if you take a 1D system and turn on any interaction, it actually becomes a lot of it. And in this case, it's going to be you know, a six-component lot of like wave coming from the different K modes that we're slicing. And if you have a Luttinger liquid, we know there's actually zero quasi-particle wave. Uh, it's a non-Fermi liquid uh, for any U. Uh, what we should see, instead of a jump in N of K, is actually power loss singularities or non-analytic, non-analyticity. Um, and if you analyze it quantitatively, that's what you find. You see that in the metallic region, it's hard to see by eye. There's some um, non-analytic kink, whereas by the time you get to the spin liquid, then it appears to be perfectly analytic. And when we look at that, yeah, when we, five minutes. Mm -hmm. When we look at that, it's consistent with this metal insulator transition actually being a BKT transition. Um, so this is interesting because it kind of suggests that you have a continuous destruction of the Fermi surface, at least in 1D. Uh, but it's a little bit unclear how you would infer the actual 2D physics uh, from these um, you know, 1D KT transitions. <laughs> okay, I'll skip this. I'll just say that the uh, L equals six cylinder uh, is basically consistent with the L equals uh, four cylinder you see within about 10%, the same two phase transitions. <clears throat> okay, so how do we identify it as a chiral spin liquid? Um, so there should be a couple different uh, signatures. One, we should see topological degeneracy. It's a topological order, and if you put it on the cylinder, for a given chirality, you should actually find two degenerate ground states. So that's in addition to the two coming from symmetry breaking, so you should get four ground states in total. Uh, there should be time reversal symmetry breaking measured by a scalar order parameter. Um, we should also be able to detect that there's these gapless edge modes you'd expect coming from a loss in length state. Um, and then finally, you should see a quantized spin hall effect. If you thread spin flux, it will uh, pump spin one half. And we see signatures for all of these. So first I'll show you the chiral order parameter. This is just the X expectation value of S dot S cross S is a function of U over T. Uh, and you can see it's uh, asymptotes to zero in the metal, zero in the one to twenty to the order phase, and then it turns on uh, in the putative um, non-magnetic insulator. So this is the evidence for spontaneous symmetry breaking of time reversal. Okay, now let's do the spin hall effects. What we do is to thread spin flux through the system. We just go back to the original Hubbard model and the up spins, you do one flux and then the down spins, you do the other flux. And then we just use the DMRG to find the ground state as we thread flux through the system and we measure the amount of spin that accumulates on the right edge versus the left edge. So that's spin pumped versus the flux thread, and you get this beautiful linear relation. And if you look at the slope of it, 
It gives exactly the quantized spin Hall effect that you expect from the chiral spin liquid. Uh, finally, we can look for chiral edge states. Uh, so the way we do it is we don't actually, in principle, we just try and do exact diagonalization of the edge spectrum. Uh, there's a cleverer way to do it, which is to actually look at the entanglement between the left and right part of the system. So if you trace out the right part of the cylinder, which is a little bit of the density matrix to the left, um, it was predicted by Kitaev and Pascal, as well as Lee and Haldane, that the spectrum of the density matrix to the left will actually look like the spectrum of the edge. So when we compute uh, what the eigenvalues are of row A versus their momentum, uh, we see this telltale counting that the degeneracy uh, uh, changes to momentum in this way, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, uh, corresponding to the actual degeneracy of the chiral states um, of the chiral spin liquid. So this is further relation, uh, evidence for the uh, chiral edge states. Okay, um, one interesting thing I want to mention is, you know, as I said, there should actually be a finite temperature Ising phase transition. What would the temperature of this phase transition be? Um, so to, to know that, what we need to know is what's the tension or the cost of putting a domain wall between the two different chiralities here. So the way that we do this in the DMRD is we actually enclose the boundary condition on the left and the right in the two different chimerism-related chiralities, and then we use the DMRD to heal the wave function in between them, and then we measure what was uh, the energy or cost uh, of introducing this domain wall. And then we look at the energy of that domain wall as a function of the circumference in order to extrapolate an energy per unit length. Um, so what this is showing here is just what chirality does. And you can see that there's some smooth domain wall between the two different possibilities. Uh, so by extracting that, we get an energy of about 5 tenths to the negative pp per unit length or 3 Kelvin per unit length. So just for fun, if you tried to map this to the uh, TC of a uh, triangular lattice Ising model, you'd get a TC of about 4K. So we'd expect time reversal symmetry breaking above that, whereas it would break up into domains above that, or time reversal symmetry breaking below that and domains above that. Um, it's fun to think about whether this could be, you know, whether any of this is seen in experiments. I'll just um, show the data here. So as I said, at the lowest temperature of the cylinder is the heat capacity. Uh, on the right, this is the heat capacity moving up to much larger temperatures. And in the inset, what they do is they subtract off the heat capacity um, relative to the anti-ferromagnetic model. And you can see, kind of interestingly, there is actually a hump in the heat capacity at about uh, 4 to 5 Kelvin. Um, the final thing I should mention is here, you can see there's actually no dependence on the heat capacity on external field. Um, how could that relate to the chiral spin liquid? Uh, you can actually work out, if you put on the magnetic field, how much does it favor one chirality versus the other? And it's actually an extremely small energy splitting between the two. If you went to 10 Tesla, it would be like um, about a tenth of a Kelvin splitting between the two chiralities. Okay, so before finishing, I just want to, you know, have one word of caution here, which is just in general, it's difficult to infer 2D physics coming from 1D cylinders. Uh, and one of the reasons is because, um, I, in my mind, what the most likely competition is between the chiral spin liquid is a nodal uh, spin liquid. So imagine rather than having a spin on to form a Fermi surface, instead they form the rock cones. That can be very subtle to detect on a cylinder because when you look at the allowed momenta on the cylinder, those momenta might actually miss the rock cone. And if the allowed momenta miss the rock cone, you might mistake it for being gapped and it's actually gapless. And I think this is what's actually happening in the Kagame Heisenberg model. Early DMRD thought it was um, gapped, but when we analyzed it in this language, we actually found evidence that it was gapless. Um, so we've done flux threading to try and check this um, in the triangular lattice model, uh, and it actually does not seem to be consistent with the drop spin liquid. So at the moment, I'm still fairly confident of this uh, chiral prediction. Um, but hopefully someone can do IPEPs or something to actually get rid of these finite circumference effects. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank my collaborators, um, and thanks for your attention. <laughs> Yeah. 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 So we didn't actually measure, we only measured the stiffness for a particular U over T, the deepest part. But yeah, certainly if we were to do it as a function of U over T, the stiffness probably changes. So and, and yeah. 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 Yeah.
that it's probably about this. I think just by eye, Aaron went to somewhere that looked like you could use like, oh, well, here's a unit system, or like by Aaron. Um, we did not quantitatively do this for a whole bunch of these, because it's expensive. We just picked a point that looked strong. Uh, so I bet it's not much, this is probably around the piece. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's very small, yeah. So, Well, okay, I should say I've been discussing it as one transition. Uh, it's quite possible that you would go to metal superconductor signatures. I mean, so that's one hobby. Yeah, uh, perhaps. So it's extremely exotic to try and do any transition, which is simultaneously be a metal and silver transition, but the symmetry breaking things on the same point. Yeah, so much more generic would be that you first have um, superconductivity, and then you could have that the superconductivity then becomes time reversal broken. So, like, so for instance, if you take a B plus ID superconductor, and which will it project it back to be the chiral symmetry. So that gives you one language for thinking that it actually is in two transitions where it's you know, not so exotic. Um, I really don't want to make any comment on what exactly, whether that's one or two transitions. I mean, you can see almost all our probes just kind of continuously turn on. So I don't actually know whether it's one or two transitions. There's one comment about the Yeah. Well, it's a matter of time scales in a sense. You could think that you could have a long time scale compared to the sort of the electron time scale, which we actually just have so many fluctuating domains. Also, a lot of metal stable states and very slow dynamics associated with this. Is it? Can you imagine some experiment that would detect this kind of linear in the main phase through, through non equilibrium means? One thing I, I can't think of though is what disorder would actually couple to a chiral wave. Yeah, yeah, I think. Well, even the random bond went couple, I mean, the random bond preserves T, so it went coupled to this one. It could couple to the, yeah, could, oh, it could, yeah, it could couple to the square. So they believe that, yeah. they believe that if there are charges between wires, they can stretch the triangle for like this. Yeah. So, so they could be. But I'm not sure because the, I'm not sure that that type of time reversal actually, so this time reversal you can think of as spinless complex conjugation is broken. Spin SO3 is completely preserved. 
it's not obvious to me that if you put a magnetic moment that that actually couples the distance. Yeah, I mean, it depends where it sits, but. Yeah, if it's actually like the BB interaction, that'd be very, I mean, it would, it would have to be that there's some super exchange coupling, but then why would it order? I, I, re I haven't thought of a impurity yet. So I think it is a very good time to stop the community discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.